Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome back to another Designer's Desk episode. Today we're taking a little closer look at the LRV, which is originally designed by Yitzi, uh, but the big breakthrough came in our 3D print department. Uh, so while we do have two astronauts sitting on here, those are the minifigures of the month, but they are sold separately from the LRV itself. Uh, but now we have Camera Guy joining us, he's the head of our 3D print department, uh, to take a little closer look at some of the uh, cool new updates that are featured in this LRV. Yeah, hey everyone, it is Camera Guy here. I finally get to be on one of these videos, imagine that. <laughs> After years of filming them. So yeah, um, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a resident space nerd. I'm, I'm, I'm just huge into all this stuff. And so uh, Dan asked if I wanted to take a shot at designing some parts for the LRV and, and I just jumped at the idea. I was like, oh yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm all over that. So we have our four wheels here. We have a set of four fenders. Um, we have the high gain antenna there. High gain antenna, right, there we go. <laughs> I, had, I had some confusion as to what that thing was when I was originally researching it. <laughs> and uh, the last element, uh, this was actually designed by Amanda, M and Art Girl, uh, one of our animators. Uh, this is a golf club, which is a bit of an anachronism. The golf club was actually flown on Apollo 14, um, and uh, Alan Shepard brought this on board along with two golf balls that he drove onto the moon. Uh, he actually only brought the the head of the golf club on board. The handle of the golf club uh, is actually a telescoping rod that was used for some of their excavation tools. And he had a golf club head that was specifically designed to fit onto the end of one of those telescoping rods because they're not, you know, they're not going to have room to bring an entire full golf club. On, that can't on board be regulation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably not. But. Uh, it's a we, nice touch. Yeah, we couldn't resist including yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice touch. It's a touch. cool piece, and if you have any of the Lunar Astronauts, either from the last time or this most recent Minifig of the Month batch, it, it really goes very nicely with those. Which this time we're just calling them Apollo Astronauts around, right? Because it was only the Apollo missions that had LRVs, correct? Exactly. Cool. So, anyway, just getting into a bit of history. Um, Back when the Apollo program was first proposed in the early 1960s, it was kind of right off the bat they knew they wanted some kind of a powered roving vehicle for the astronauts. And initially, when they were planning these missions, their plan was to use multiple Saturn V launches for a single lunar mission. So hmm. the plan was they would have one launch that would deliver the astronauts and some of the cargo and a lander, and another launch that would deliver another larger lander that would have sort of a habitation module as well as a large pressurized roving vehicle. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> so there were, uh, there, were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of different concepts. There were like six different companies that were competing sure. to get the contract to design this vehicle. And uh, Northrop and Grumman, two different companies back in the day, uh, they actually competed and produced two very large pressurized vehicles. Um, and as the missions have got scaled down, uh, it became very clear. You know, once they finally decided on the single launch and the uh, the in-orbit rendezvous and all that, uh, sure, it became clear that these rovers were not going to be able to fit inside the mission profile. Well, that's so, fascinating. I don't think a lot of people knew that the moon buggy wasn't exactly the initial plan. <laughs> oh, not at all. It was a it was a much more sort of sci-fi looking vehicle that they had going on. Fascinating. Um, but then eventually, they you know they realized that they did have a little bit of leftover room and a little bit of leftover weight margin in the lunar lander as it ended up being designed. And so they put out another design contest with a whole bunch of different companies and Boeing actually came out on top. They, they're the ones who designed the lunar rover vehicle. Okay. Um, they got awarded the contract for the design in 1969 and by 1971, only 18 months later, they had a fully functional wow. rover designed and ready to go. Talk about a turnaround time. <laughs> yeah. So the Lunar Rover vehicle itself, uh, it's an electric vehicle. It has four motors, one for each wheel. Um, they're all independently powered, uh, and all four wheels steer. That's, that's also represented on this model. You can, you can turn the wheels <laughs> inward, so all of them can steer. And in real life, the Lunar Rover vehicle had a turning radius of just 10 feet. <laughs> so this thing could turn on a dime. Um, and then it was, it was powered by batteries. They were non-rechargeable batteries and uh, the batteries could give it a range of nearly 60 miles. Wow. Um, so this thing could cruise, they could, they could go a distance with it. They could, but officially the mission profiles said that they were not allowed to go farther than walking distance from the lunar module. Oh, in, in case, case it, it broke down. down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that being said, each subsequent lunar mission did go a little bit further out from the lunar module, and by <laughs> Apollo 17, they actually got nearly five miles away from the lunar module. I don't know if five miles is considered walking distance sure. on the moon. That sounds like a bit of a hike to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is thoroughly fascinating. 
Yeah. So uh, it's it's officially rated top speed by Boeing was eight miles per hour. But on Apollo 17, uh, Eugene Cernan just opened up the throttle and went as fast as he could go. And he actually managed to achieve a blazing 11.2 miles per hour. On so, the surface of the moon. Yeah, Eugene Cernan holds the official lunar land speed record. <laughs> lunar land speed record. That's incredible. Just opened it up. What a liberating feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know this thing, this thing would bounce quite a bit too. I mean, it had it had fairly springy suspension. Um, but in addition to that, these wheels, these wheels, are, they were designed by General Motors, and they're actually a wire mesh. It was it was a steel mesh woven, uh, coated in zinc, and then it had these titanium chevrons that were sort of sure. bolted onto the edge of it. And so the wheels had sort of suspension of their own, and then the vehicle itself had suspension connecting the wheels to the frame. And so uh, you combine that with the fact that this 460 pound vehicle only weighed 77 pounds once it was on the lunar surface <laughs> or 250 pounds if it was fully loaded with astronauts and cargo and it would it would kind of bounce around there so I bet <laughs> you didn't want it going too fast lest you ramp off a crater and maybe you don't come back <laughs> no down again. kidding you don't have enough weight to get back to it wow that's fascinating so obviously that's a little bit more about like the lunar rover itself but talk to me a little bit about the process you know when you got the proposition from Dan, do you want to try to design these parts? Where do you even start with something like that? Uh, I started with a lot of photos. And fortunately, um, NASA being NASA and documenting everything they do, there are a lot of photos. There are photos of all sorts of stages of the design process. There's photos of prototypes of the different wheels and components. Um, there's all sorts of specs and diagrams for these. So. The wheels are definitely the most complicated part, and they're what took the longest to get the design and the printing right and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're obviously been greatly simplified for these kits, but I just I really tried to get that look of the the mesh, and it is. I don't know if you can see that, but it is really a hollow mesh in there. You can see the wow. light through it. Um, those spars that you see on the inside, those were bump stops. They were big, thick hoops on the inside of the rim, and they would stop the the mesh from deforming too far, stop it from sort of folding inside out. So you itself. have a little give, but not too much to give you a flat. Exactly, exactly. Cool. Um, the fenders, um, you know, the fenders on the real rover, they weren't just there to, to make it look stylish. Um, they served a very important purpose. Uh, they, uh, earlier lunar missions sort of uh, let people know what the lunar regolith was like. Um, and it's, it's incredibly powdery, because in, on the moon there's no water in the atmosphere or on the ground to allow so tiny bits of sand up. to stick together. So you have this fine dust, like talcum powder fine dust, and Oof. it gets everywhere. It's coarse and rough and irritating. So these fenders were actually there to keep the dust from being kicked up onto the astronauts and the instruments. Um, on Apollo 16, they broke one of the fenders, and it ended up covering both the astronauts really badly in dust, as well as the entire rover, rover to the point where the rover actually started overheating. Uh, when, when the rover wants to vent heat, uh, since there's no air to conduct heat, it has to do so entirely by radiation. But oh. it, it created this insulating layer that no heat could radiate away from the rover. So it still propelled itself, but it got a lot less range on the batteries than they otherwise would have expected. So the batteries that powered this vehicle, actually the primary way that they were cooled, they were encased in a wax and the wax had a relatively low melting point. It was a solid block of wax when it was unloaded, and as it drove, the heat from the batteries would go into melting that wax. And so that's actually how they kept the batteries cool for a while anyway. They could, it would just phase change the wax from a solid into a liquid, and in doing so, remove heat from the batteries in the electrical system. Something similar happened on Apollo 17. But on Apollo 17, they were able to think ahead and they, they had some duct tape with them and they took some of their maps of the moon and they built a fender out of duct tape and maps and taped it on over the wheel. That's using your head. So they were able to keep going again. Wow, you never would have thought by looking, I mean obviously they add a cool layer of detail, but you never would have thought that they were such an essential part of this vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, other, other features of the, the rover itself, um, you've got this camera on the front, it's a color TV camera, and this is actually a remotely operated camera that was controlled by Houston on Earth. So they could use this, even when the rover wasn't in motion, they could use this to get interesting shots of the crew as they were doing their EVAs. And there's a really famous shot, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, of the, uh, of the ascent module on the lander taking off after one of the missions. Of and that was controlled by this camera. And they, they tried that on 
all three missions that had a rover, and it wasn't really until Apollo 17 that they got the timing just right. Because you, know, you send the signal from Earth, there's a two-second delay before it gets to the camera, so they send the signal pan up, and the first few times they were a bit off because they didn't get the timing just right. But sure. eventually we got that shot that we all know and love today. Wow, that's amazing. And you always wonder too, like, oh man, how did they get that? There's such a conspiracy. Not really, <laughs> they, had, they had a camera they were mm -hmm. operating. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's about it for this model and, and for the history. Um, that, uh, oh, one more detail on the model. Uh, Landon put together this really cool uh, UV printed tile as the control panel sure. on, the, on the front there. Um, I don't know how close I can get in. Up oh, there, there we go. Yeah, a little closer look at that, very cool. Gotta love the detail that's packed into such a teeny little kit and yet you guys have really revamped it to, uh, to be a breakthrough model. And it does, um, it can actually fold up. I can... Uh, oh wow, really? Yeah, it, uh, you have to take like the real thing, you have to take most of the instruments off. Mm -hmm. You have to remove the antenna, you have to remove the, the camera. This is all stuff that they would have attached or unfolded uh, after it was, but you have the the front of the vehicle. Oh, wow. oh, come on. There we go. The front of the vehicle folds up like that, the rear as well, and then the wheels actually fold down and <laughs> in like that. And it's hard to get it to fold up exactly as compactly as it would in Lego, but sure. this is roughly how the real one would have folded up. And on the real one, from the top down, it would have looked like a triangle. And then it fits perfectly into a little triangular uh, hole in the side of the lunar lander. And then that's how they unload it. Wow. Well, I bet some of you out there who actually already own your LRV probably didn't know it could do that. So there you can check that out now. So one detail about these wheels, when you get your model, uh, you'll notice there is actually a right and a left hand version. So the chevrons, they face forward when they're going over the top of the wheel. So just make sure when you're putting on your wheel, you get the right on the right side, you get the left on the left side. So you see the chevrons face forward there. And then there's, there's two sides to the wheel. There's a side that has an indentation for that Technic half pin, and then there's a side that doesn't. The side that doesn't is the side that faces out. And when you're putting the fenders on, on the real rover vehicle, the rear fender covered a full 180 degree sweep across the wheels. The front fender actually stopped a little bit before the front of the wheels. So what you can do with these, have your rear fender straight across and then tilt the front fender back, and you can achieve that exact same look. It's one of the benefits from hearing from the people who designed it. All right, now let's toss it over to Landon and take a little closer look at the minifigure of the month, the Apollo astronaut. Okay, hey, it's Lando here with the minifigure of the month. You've seen this guy before. Um, we've released him in small quantities. Now we have him for a, a bit bigger of a... Yeah, new, much more bigger, plentifully yeah, available. More availability now. Obviously goes perfectly with this kit. Um, and I, I, have an, I have an older review for this. So if you want to check that out, there'll be a link in the description. That one was technically called the Lunar Astronaut, right. correct? This is the Apollo Astronaut. Yeah, that's right. Um, same artwork on this one. Uh, I think there are a lot of people that didn't get a chance to uh, get this guy just Definitely. due to the limited quantities. And we figured since we're coming out with this uh, awesome Lunar Lander, let's, uh, let's bring this figure back. Um, of course, we have um, two amazing 3D printed parts on this guy, the helmet and that life support, the PLSS, right? Is that what that is? Yeah, PLSS, Portable Life Support System. Yes, the Portable Life Support System, that backpack. Um, there are some just amazing diagrams out there that show how all this stuff works. And um, just, I guess, like camera guy, I was pouring over a ton of source images while designing this guy. Um, based off of um, this, the overall suit is, is kind of a direct lineage from earlier uh, Navy pressure suits, so from okay. the US Navy. Um, doing lots of uh, um, experimentation with this and it's actually really interesting underneath this kind of the white protective layer on this suit there's this kind of bright blue and orange suit with all these laces and expansion ports um, it's a, it's totally looks sci-fi underneath of this I mean this suit already does look sci-fi no kidding but underneath of this um, underneath of the protective coating you'll just see exactly where a lot of um, different sci-fi movies are getting their spacesuits from because it's all underneath of this um, really cool um, but um, yeah, all these different nozzles and ports for oxygen and um, just maintaining um, a life support system uh, for the astronauts. Um, and I guess the biggest thing they had to overcome was mobility in that, in that negative pressure, in that no pressure environment. Um, since they have to have a one Earth pressure atmosphere inside of the suit, it's a bit less than one Earth atmosphere, I believe. Um, but it actually would balloon out on them. So they actually had to have this internal harnesses and cables and pulleys 
just so they could move their arms around. And the, wow. that, the gloves alone are just kind of a miracle of engineering. Um, just all the little cables and pulleys that just they have t so they can even move. Um, it's it's really, really fascinating to see how that the whole suit was uh, put together. So well, and it gives you an idea of how the entire thing has to work in harmony. You know yeah. What I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of fun researching this. Um, so yeah, again, this is a direct lineage of, of some really uh, amazing um, Navy pressure suits um, that we've had a chance to design here before and, and show off. So it's it's cool to get one of the later pieces uh, of, of um, you know, history designed uh, in minifigure form. So I had a lot of fun making this. So there you have it, the designer's desk for the new and improved LRV uh, and the minifigure of the month, the Apollo astronaut. Once again, remember these two things are sold separately. Both of them are available right now at brickmania.com.